Okay, welcome to today's webinar. Today our topic is going to be ageism and it's being presented by Linda Anderson and Holly Schick from Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is Carol. I'm a registered nurse and the nursing practice advisor on the practice team here at the SRNA. And my role today will be to help facilitate the webinar. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge um, the land that we are on as we gather here today. We acknowledge that we are on Treaty 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, eight and 10 territories and the home of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Our topic today is ageism and it's going to be presented by Linda Anderson and Holly Schick from the Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism. Okay. Well, glad to be here. I'm, I'm Linda and uh, SSM, my role is communication and ageism awareness. So this, this webinar is pretty well up my alley. And Holly? Uh, I am Holly and I'm the executive director at SSM and very glad to be here with you today. So we are from Saskatchewan Seniors Mechanism and as you see our, uh, our tagline that what, what it is we're about, we're saying older adults are moving forward, constantly so. And we have a vision and the vision is quality life for all older adults in Saskatchewan. Well, it's a good vision and we work away at it and people seem to feel that that is, that is exactly where we're wanting to go. But ageism, ageism is something that does create an obstacle to us achieving this vision. It gets in the way. So sometimes we have to go around or go over it or do something about that obstacle. And this webinar is part of that. So one of the things that we need to know is that many older people are contributing to society. If we look around our communities, we may know that. However, there are negative attitudes towards older people. And it's these three things turn out. We stereotype, which is how we think. We uh, discriminate, which is how we act. And prejudice is how we feel. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on in, in this webinar. But what the World Health Organization says is that those prejudices, those reactions, those attitudes have very bad effects on health and well-being of older people. The positive thing is ageism, unlike aging, isn't inevitable. And longevity is here to stay. The world has changed very, very much. And people talk about, my goodness, our population of older adults is growing and growing. Uh, we have seen figures that say that by 2030, that the older proportion, the 75 plus portion, will have increased immensely, that it'll increase even more than the, the younger portion, which is, of course, uh, something like the baby boomers going through. And that's precisely where it is. But what's important to remember, that longevity isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. And ending ageism will help us to see that it's a benefit for us all. It's an advantage for us when we think about how older adults contribute. Back on that other side again, this one's from Australia. Uh, the Benevolent Society in Australia did uh, years long surveying and reporting and investigating and analysis. And they found, unfortunately, that ageism is growing. It isn't lessening, it's growing. That it's having the perceived value of older people is declining rather than growing. Now this report came out a couple of years ago 
and Australia has been working away, so I'll be interested to see what future reports might say. But that declining value, the understanding's declining value, is having real effects on people. And in Canada, who has noticed? Well, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Hazel McCallion, who was the former mayor of Mississauga. When I lived in Toronto, Hazel was the mayor. We called her Hurricane Hazel. At that time, she was probably in her 80s. And she was active. And I must say, I didn't agree with all of her policies, but I sure respected her caring and her activity. This little picture down here of Hazel in the green is from this year, March 17th, St. Patrick's Day and her 100th birthday. And there she was. So Hazel says, Canadians need to confront the reality that every day its older citizens deal with the most widely tolerated form of social prejudice in the country, and that is ageism. It is tolerated more than some of the other ages, other, other isms, I guess is what I should say. This uh, little statement is from a woman named Rachel McAlpine. She's an author. She's in her 70s now, and she uh, lives in New Zealand. And she points out that once your eyes are opened, once you become conscious of ageism, you can see it. You can see it everywhere. And you can see how old people are still unthinkingly stereotyped and mocked and rejected. For what? Because they're old. And Rachel went on as she became more and more aware to say that the worst thing for her was when she recognized in herself the same contempt. And I believe that comes when a person thinks, well, there's those old, frail, having lost their memory, old people. They're something else. They're other. I'm not that. And there comes that little bit of contempt for their uh, declining abilities, cognitive or physical. And she found that puzzled her. And it puzzled her to the point she did some art. And she wrote this poem that I'm going to read now. I found ageism rampaging in my neighborhood, in job descriptions and prescriptions, in jokes and compliments and ads on every screen, in tips and fads, on videos and TV shows, in greeting cards, in camouflage and tiny acts of sabotage. I found it looming over me on billboards, big and bald. The assumptions, the assumptions, dooming youth to aspirations, dooming age to loss and pain. But the very shockingest of shocks was to meet the advocates of ageism within, using my mouth to speak their nonsense sniping and sneering and whining and lobbying and mocking the old for being old from a stadium under my skin. So give some thought for a minute to your experiences in your life. Have you ever been treated differently because of your age? And often people who are treated differently are the younger and the older in the spectrum. Uh, sometimes we categorize teen, and we certainly categorize older adults in a, a certain way. So have you ever been treated differently because of your age? Do you mind revealing your age publicly? Do you have any sense that revealing your age uh, in some way affect treat you? Can it affect um, your chances of promotion? or getting a job, are your chance better or worse because of your age? I'm not sure in, in nursing, I think that uh, someone who's older uh, would have experience and that would be a good thing. On the other hand, uh, 
in nursing? Does it affect uh, uh, whether you get a certain promotion, a certain job? If you are 64 as compared to 34? Has anyone ever told you you don't look your age? How did you feel about that? Think for a minute about what are the most common and effective ways that ageism is spread in our families and in our communities and in our workplaces. What do you think the most common and effective ways are? Well, interestingly, the answer to that question is that the most common and effective ways are in our own words very often. Our own words reveal the ageism that's embedded within us that we've learned over years and years and may not even recognize is there. And our words continue to spread that ageism to others and reinforce it in ourselves. So we're gonna think for a moment about ageist concepts. Is it an ageist statement to say, you don't look 72? What's wrong with that? A lot of people would take that as a compliment uh, if they're 72. But what does 72 look like? What do we expect certain ages to look like? What about the statement, wow, she's 78 and still takes online classes? Hmm, that sounds like it's a compliment, doesn't it? Well, just a minute. If you removed, a couple, of words, that. Bobby, if you removed a couple of words from that statement, it would be a compliment. Absolutely. And that's the issue. Wow. Like, why is it astounding that someone who's 78 is taking online classes? And what about the word still? Well, she's 78 and takes on online classes. That's just a statement of fact. But being amazed by that and implying that there's something strange about doing that still takes online classes. There should be nothing unusual about that. I'm over 65 and don't want to be called a senior. Well, we hear that one a lot uh, at SSM, where, where Linda and I work. People are worried about being labeled with words like senior or old. And the reason for that tends to be that they carry a certain baggage. Words carry baggage with them quite often. Uh, so people get the impression that might mean that they're no longer important, that they're gonna be seen in a certain way. We often try to use the term older adults uh, when it comes to talking about older people, but there should be nothing wrong with saying senior or referring to someone as old. There's nothing wrong with being old. Only ageism a says more examples coming up for you. Yeah, only ageism says old is bad, young is good. That's right. That's right. So a couple more examples. And here we're getting into uh, a, a territory that many of you might be familiar with. And that's the medical area. So the doctor uh, talking to you and his son Tom is with him. Uh, so doctor says, Tom, your dad has an early stage of prostate cancer. It grows slowly, so we probably won't do radiation or surgery. Well, there's lots of things wrong with this statement. First of all, why is the doctor talking to Tom and not to Bill? Lots of times people of any age might want someone along with them, a family member or friend, to hear what's said, to help them remember what's said, remember the questions they want to ask when they go to a medical appointment.
but that doesn't mean the doctor should be talking to Tom. There's an implication there that Bill's not going to be able to understand or that uh, uh, Bill shouldn't be the one spoken to. He's too old. And Tom is the one that's important to talk to. Well, that's not the way it should be at all. And there's another piece of ageism in this statement. And it's in that second part of it. It grows slowly, so we probably won't do radiation or surgery. Why not? Would, this, would the same thing be true if Bill was 50? Probably not. And what about that last statement? Hi, Granny, time to get up for breakfast. This is one that you might uh, particularly hear in a long-term care facility, for instance, uh, where uh, there are people who are aides and caregivers uh, who are encouraging someone that it's now time for breakfast. Mm -hmm. So what's wrong with this? Well, calling someone Granny. Uh, is that their granny? No, probably not. Uh, so is that appropriate? And uh, what are other ways that you might address someone? And most important of all, ask the person what they would like to be called. Do they want to be referred to by their name? Do they be, want to be referred to as Mrs. or Ms. or Mr. So-and-so? Or do they want to be called granny? Maybe they think that's a great thing. And in fact, sometimes the way we address people can reflect our cultural background and what's common in our culture, whatever that is. And so it's important to remember, let's check with people and see what they want to be called. Uh, I said earlier on that we would look a little bit more closely about uh the construction of ageism and how ageism is revealed. And so the little box on the left-hand side of the screen, I think it's where you'd see it in the, in the broadcast, uh, talks about the cognitive, the, the logical, the brain, the cognitive. That's where our perceptions show. This is what we think. And then what we think though, affects our emotions. And it's from our emotions that we show prejudice. And some of those emotions can be fear, can be resentment, can be just a hesitancy about the other. So that'll come out with a, pre with a prejudice of either wanting to avoid or putting people down simply because it feels as though they're not as good now as they once were. And that's the part where you're moving to the behavioral results of thinking in a certain way and where discrimination starts to happen. And can discrimination can be so subtle and it can occur in different ways and in different, in different ways that we interact with people. And that's what the right-hand box is about. And there's implicit and explicit ageism that occurs. On the micro level, that's interpersonally amongst individuals, where you might have said the, the compliment about, my, you don't look 72. Well, that's an, that's an implicit and explicit ageism all the way through that somehow 72 is not very great, but you don't look it so, so you're okay. And then there's other interpersonal reactions where the ageism might occur. The meso broaden it, broadens itself out to our networks, our contact networks, whether we're in an organization. So I'm part of the Regina Woodcarvers uh, group. And there's lots of older adults in the Regina Woodcarvers group, but do we then kind of implicitly say, well, you're a bunch of old people. And where that came out, uh, I think most often was when there was a decision around how we're gonna meet during the pandemic, how can we be together? Well, maybe we can do it on Facebook. And immediately there was some explicit ageism that said, well, most of our guys, there's a little sexism goes on too, 
most of our guys aren't able to go on Facebook. So what good would that be? Well, I mean, they worked their way through and actually there is a Facebook group for the wood carvers now. And then the big one, the macro. And that's embedded in our societies through our institutional policies or our cultural traditions. What we expect and to see and how we expect to treat and interact with older adults of whatever kind. And in the pandemic, one of the places in what was meant to be a good thing, uh, there would be little community groups and thinking about, well, what can we do? And one of them might have even been in our age-friendly communities and their committees who said, well, how can we help those poor older people that are stuck in their homes? But not very much thinking that perhaps those older people could do some helping one another, that they're still capable of having ideas and thinking how to do that. So implicit and explicit, and once you begin to see it and realize it, you see how it affects how we behave, how we treat one another, and how we might limit the contributions of older adults and be, and our whole society loses from that. <laughs> So here we have the potential causes of ageism. Mm -hmm. Take a look first at the uh, rectangle on the upper right hand side of your screen. And this would particularly uh, uh, affect people who were working in a setting such as long term care or working in a hospital setting uh, where most of the patients they dealt with were older. So healthcare staff being surrounded by elderly patients with severe health conditions, if that's what you see all the time, that's what you're going to start to expect older adults to be. So it gives the impression that all older adults, all elderly individuals are frail and helpless. And it's important not to get trapped in just thinking all older adults are like some small group that are the ones you have encountered. And then if you move to the rectangle at the upper left-hand side of the screen, uh, by the way, these slides, uh, the next one, these medical slides uh, have come to us I've off the website with permission from uh, a training college in, uh, in the USA in Boston called Regis College. And it has uh, uh, both uh, regular degrees and postgraduate work that they do, but they're specialists specialize in nursing, health, public service and education. And their vision is just and compassionate global society. So that's part of why they've done this work and are giving these uh, uh, some help with for others around the ageism factor. So this is what I hadn't thought of until I saw these slides and read this, that when you think about it, if you do as Holly has just said from the first slide, you begin to think, begin to think all older adults are frail and helpless and you don't wanna be there. So what can happen emotionally is that you develop a negative bias against those old and you think of them as other, other than you. They're, they're not really human and with it the way you are. They're kind of the other. They're not like me, but, and I'm not going to be that ever. And that can be a kind of a take down the terror factor that Yikes, in 20 years, maybe I'll be being looked after this way and I don't wanna be that. And who knows what's gonna happen as we uh, age. And, and actually the odds are that most of us won't become as frail and have as many physical problems that we need 24 hour care. But we tend to jump to that fear and it's there in our society. And as far as the professionals go, the box down below, the functional approach theory. And these are, this is particularly um, can apply to 
the healthcare workers, the professionals, the nurses who are working in these kinds of situations. So that stereotype of the individuals, they are the people, they're there, we have to look after them. I am the professional, I'm functional. And so I will concentrate on the task aspects of the care of these others. And the more efficiently that these tasks are accomplished, the more respected the healthcare worker will be in his or her in-group of professionals. It's the place where we want to be. And if you take a look uh, at the rectangle on the lower right side of your screen, uh, where it talks about trainees attitudes being shaped by misconceptions. And I don't think it's just trainees attitudes. I think it is the attitudes of many people uh, in the healthcare system, where you think about, is it indeed nobler, more important to treat a young mother than an 89 year old with complex health issues? Well, the pandemic has certainly raised those kind of concerns for us as we became aware, maybe there'd be a point where there was a need to triage uh, who was treated that had COVID-19 because we knew we couldn't handle it. So that fear was there. What about, is there going to be a lack of ventilators? Who would get the ventilators? And while we never actually made it uh, to the point, at least here in, in our part of the world, where that kind of triaging had to happen, we saw that it happened in some parts of the world. And so were decisions being made? Would we have made decisions based on age? What would that have done to those decisions? And taking a look at the, whoops, at the uh, bottom one that runs across the pro there that says training programs don't do enough to combat trainees negative views of older adults and to promote geriatrics. Something that needs to go into the training in all kinds of places and you nurses can think about not only your original training, but the, all the kinds of seminars and training efforts that go on during your nursing career and that you can also look around you at the same kinds of training that goes for other healthcare workers with whom you associate whether they're the uh, personal support workers or whether they're the doctors and I want to quote Dr. Samir Sinha who is the director of geriatrics at Mount Sinai Health in Toronto very well recognized as a uh, an effective and knowledgeable uh, doctor of geriatrics. And here's, he recommends that collaborative education to support and prepare physicians, nurses, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, social workers, and all relevant healthcare professionals is a necessity. He says that those who are not exposed to caring for or working with older adults will be less confident in their knowledge and skills for treating older patients and therefore will be less prepared to meet their needs. So looking now at the interaction, particularly with uh, between physicians and elderly patients and the kinds of uh, those interactions and what they will do. Now you nurses certainly work with doctors all of the time and you may see some of these behaviors and you may see them in some doctors. You may see them exactly the opposite in other doctors, perhaps who are more familiar and use some geriatric training tactics. But doctors that uh, don't quite understand yet, and they may be less patient, less engaged, less egalitarian, because they think of these elderly people in a stereotypical way. 
they may assume that, of course, they have some cognitive decline, that they'll want to tell long stories and, and use up their precious time, that they may raise issues that really, no, they're just small issues, and therefore that one less responsive to issues raised by the patients. They're more interested in provider raised topics. So they'll talk to the institution and say, what about this person? More so than the patient themselves. More likely to use elder speak. And I don't know if you've come across elder speak, but it's there. The slower, the, sometimes louder, slower, exaggerated, talk louder, that'll, that'll help and a simpler vocabulary. Don't use the medical term or explain it, just say something else. And that bottom line assumption that the patient is cognitively, cognitively impaired, so you're not gonna explain anything about it. So you as nurses, this is a delicate little balance, isn't it? You can't just bop on in and make it look as though the doctor is doing something wrong. But what can you do and what can you keep in mind? Is it possible, and I'm asking you this because I don't know the answer, how much can you help because you interact with the patients? Can you help if you do have data about a patient and their issues that a doctor might be undervaluing and that you're concerned about? Or are there ways that simply as you interact with patient and doctor that you set a different kind of example? It's a tricky place, but it's important. And I really do think that you nurses have such a key role to play in all aspects of patients' care that this, this is really important. Mm -hmm. So some examples of ageism in healthcare. Uh, one is physicians who dismiss a treatable pathology as a feature of old age. Well, you can just expect that. You're getting older. Uh, you can expect things to hurt a little more or your joints to be achy. And therefore just dismiss that rather than looking at possible ways to treat something. And in some ways, the flip side of that is that healthcare providers sometimes treat the natural effects of aging as a disease and try and find some drug or some solution for absolute aging, because our bodies do change as we age. Another example is staff members who share or laugh at ageist jokes. And this is like jokes about any group, uh, that those jokes, they might seem harmless, but really what they're doing is furthering stereotypes. And in this case, furthering ageist stereotypes. Staff members who have implicit ageist thoughts, feelings and behaviors toward el elderly patients. And so often that without conscious awareness is important. That's talking about how that sense of ageism gets embedded in many of us. We don't even stop to think about it. We don't realize it. And therefore we further ageism. And that goes along with providers who apply stereotypes to older adults, whether consciously or unconsciously. An interesting one, at, and the last one, that elderly adults with multiple chronic illnesses are excluded from clinical trials to keep them focused on a general population. And we saw some of that with the pandemic and the vaccine trials that yes, you, you want to know how this is gonna affect the general population, but then the realization that, gosh, we've got to find out how this is going to affect particular groups in the population. And should people be excluded because of age or because of having multiple chronic issues. Another aspect to ageism in healthcare is self-ageism. 
And this is something that, that while it comes from older adults themselves, is something that healthcare providers can help older adults with at times. So older adults are sometimes like, less likely to seek healthcare. The same notion of, well, it's just old age. Uh, nothing, nobody can help me with this. And same kind of reasons are more likely to be under treated. They don't necessarily seek healthcare and they maybe don't speak up about the issues and concerns that they have with their health. That's where healthcare providers can help that. Ask questions, encourage them to share what's going on, uh, not just uh, in one area, but, but to encourage them to talk about their life, how their life is being affected by their health and the issues they might be facing. Sometimes self-ageism can result in people who are less likely to engage in preventive behaviors. They think, oh, I'm too old, doesn't matter anyway. I'm just getting old and it's all downhill from here. So they pass on having regular physical examinations. They don't worry so much about what they eat. Perhaps even things like, eh, why do I need to use a seatbelt? I'm old anyway. Does it really matter if I get hurt? Or exercise. So self-ageism certainly is an issue. And it's one that I think helps, can help older adults address quite often. So this uh, is a slide that has some detail in it because it's talking about how it is that research from various uh, groups and medical groups and other groups show the reality of ageism and how it actually can affect the physical, mental health that older people have as they, as they age and as they go on, which makes a big difference in the amount of healthcare in the end that a person is going to need or the likelihood that you'll be able to remain as at relatively active and uh, contributing in family and community. So this first one, uh, just as Holly was talking about, uh, if you are have embedded ageism in yourself and those around you, then you don't talk about health care as much as other people would. You, you don't talk to your providers. You don't talk to your doctor. You don't go to the clinic. You maybe don't go to alternate health and get some help with physiotherapy for that darn thing in your neck that keeps going click when it shouldn't and hurts, all those kinds of things. We also know, and this is quite true, so we're back to Bill and Tom from the example of ages ago, seniors accompanied to medical visits raise fewer topics and are less assertive. The group dynamic changes. Now, I've gone with my partner, Bill, to visit his doctor. We, we had changed. We both now have the same GP. Very good. We like him. It's all great. But certainly, and he certainly is not ageist and only talks to Bill. But Bill wants me to hear, too, just in case there's something. He always thinks that my medical degree off the back of the cornflakes box is, is better than some others. So he'd like to have my opinion, which is kind of complimentary. Anyway, the group dynamic there, it can be helpful or not helpful. With our doctor, it's helpful because I might remember something that Bill was talking about that he wanted to talk and that he's forgotten, even though he's written most of his stuff down on a note, which is a good thing for people to do when you're going for your, your, your examination or your, your visit. But the group dynamic is definitely different. When I accompanied my sister Mavis when she was in her, her cancer journey and we went to the clinics, it sometimes the doctors wanted to talk to me rather than to her. Back to that dynamic. And the trouble is down in the purple, those negative age stereotypes can result in actual physical illness 
that, and I think the one at the bottom is the one where most of it happens uh, through tension, uh, ageism and the internal tension of that can result in more inflammation throughout the body, more cortisol secretions, which we don't want. And all of those physiological pathways are closely related to cardiovascular disease and severe loss of cognitive performance. You might think yourself into, into having poor cognitive ability. That's pretty scary. And we don't need that for our older people. And we don't need that for those of you that help to care for them. So, taking steps to reduce age, ageism in healthcare. Uh, part at the bottom, although I do like this picture of all of the different kinds of older people who are getting, getting health care. Do they all look the same? No. Do they all need the same care? No. But they all need care and they all need consultation and they all need to be respected as it happens. But the trouble is that the ageism in health care exists throughout our systems. It's in all kinds of health care. And I'm now focusing on Saskatchewan, whether it's in institutions, in clinics, in home care, health businesses, pharmacies, there's places where the ageism shows itself. So we at SSM are really feeling that what we've learned is that there needs to be systemic change for all older adults and all aspects because everybody is being affected. So we're trying to work on this by promoting positive aging and encouraging the rethinking of support for older adults. And that includes a number of things. First of all, it includes home supports. And those supports are so people can stay in their own homes as long as possible. That might mean increases in, in home care. And it means looking at things uh, beyond the medical and personal care aspects. Things like helping people to maintain their yard or do some of the heavier aspects of the housekeeping tasks. People want to be able to stay in their own homes as long as possible. And everyone wants to be able to have choices about where we live and how we live. Long-term care, we need to change some ways we do things there. Certainly you think, oh, the pandemic shows us some of the things that need to change, but they're beyond the kinds of things the pandemic has pointed out in many ways, because ageism occurs when we see long-term care as a place where all it's about is medical care, and all it is about is looking after people's medical needs. Because long-term care should be seen as the resident's home. This is perhaps the last home that they will live in, and it still is their home. And those residents still want to contribute to the world around them. They want to be engaged. They want to be creative. They want to have a sense of purpose and a sense of community. And that can involve a real shift in the understanding of the staff roles to shift away from uh, usually focusing on a medical maintenance model to supporting quality of life for those residents. The interesting thing about making a shift to providing more home supports, shifting the way we think about supporting older adults along the continuum of aging is that it is cost effective too. It's interesting that many things that we've seen indicate that keeping people in their own homes with additional home supports 
actually cost about one third of what it costs to have someone in long term care. So this is important. It's a, a cost effective of addressing people's needs and giving people the things that they want. It's a win win. People can have quality of life, both in their own homes as they age with additional home supports, or as they move into long term care, they can still have quality of life at that point in their lives. It's a win win because they're healthier, happier, governments get to spend less, and communities get to keep their residents there as long as possible contributing to those communities. Definitely a win-win as we address systemic ageism in these ways. So here we are. These are, we need strategies throughout. And these are some of the strategies that Regis College has indicated in this particular slide. What are the things that we can do that will help to reduce the ages and the things that we've talked about. And uh, it's around practices and attitudes that are not ageist, ages. you set the example, you do things, you begin to move and change. So you actively work to reconstruct the ageist attitudes in the elderly patients themselves. You acknowledge the need to eliminate ageism in practice identify ageist attitudes and practices. And the key one, and I think it's what Holly was just talking about as we move towards saying uh, what we can do around quality life and considering uh, how older adults are treated with, whether in home care or whether in institutions, an individualized person-centered treatment of approach. Because when you think about it, older people probably are considered to be the range of about, say, age 60 to 110. Now, if you thought about the age range, age 21 to 61, would you think they were all the same and needed exactly the same kind of care? I doubt it. And neither do those other ones, those older ones, age 60 plus. So we know that elderly patients deserve the same quality of care and attention from healthcare practitioners that younger patients receive. And we know that once healthcare organizations can identify the ageism, can look then to provide equity, to have leaders and managers and advanced practice nurses, if you change your attitudes, that will embrace change. I believe that's the conclusion. All right, ladies, thank you so much. That was a great presentation. Lots to think about, um, you know, in regards to ageism and sort of how we perhaps treat our seniors. And I never really looked at it from the perspective of they, they, seniors can age themselves too, right? They believe I'm, I'm old and I'm frail and I need to be taken care of. So it's not just, you know, sort of the younger people treating the older people with a lack of respect and, um, you know, ageism, uh, but it's all of us, right? It's yeah. just a societal attitude, really. So, yeah, so thank you so much for yeah, that. It was absolutely. fantastic. It was fantastic. Um, it, we're open for questions now. If anybody has um, anything they'd like to ask Holly and Linda, two very well-informed ladies here. So <laughs> I'm sure they'd be happy to answer some questions if there are any. I just I just have that one comment and I can't remember the entire term because I've listened, trying to catch so much, but the terror theory, you know, the young people are afraid of, of becoming, you know, thinking about when they'll get old and, I have to admit, I can completely relate to that. Like I'm sort of in the middle now, but I remember being younger and yeah, if you, maybe if you're that person that didn't have a lot of exposure to, you know, more senior people and see that they could be something more than someone sick in a bed, you know, and you're thinking, oh, that's, that'll never be me, never be me, right? And uh, yeah, it becomes us. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I can see that 
you know, people trying to avoid that and perhaps being disrespectful in their communication with elders without really intending to be, I think. So anyways. I know that one of the things that uh, comments that came up at our conference uh, was that prior to the pandemic, uh, people didn't want to be in long-term care and now they're terrified of it. Oh, uh, So it, it's interesting. Uh, nobody wants what they think of as the negative image, the, the ageist image right. of what getting old is going to be. Yeah. Uh, so how do we shift that? How yeah. do we uh, help people to see that all older adults are not the same? Right. And all older adults still have a contribution to make and are Absolutely. still of value no yeah. matter what their circumstance. Yeah. And no matter what their contribution is, you know, some people, you know, um, perhaps are still out there in the public and doing all sorts of things. But uh, uh, I'll use my mom as an example, a very vibrant lady, but she's got two great grandchildren that she's going to babysit all summer because they live close to her and my niece and her husband, you know, it's, it's just a cheaper thing. And she keeps up with those kids and believe me, they're busy. So that's her contribution, right? And it shouldn't be negated yeah. because, oh, she's too old to do that. No, that's not true. So, yeah, everyone has a contribution to make. Yes, very One much so. Fellows, uh, uh, in response to our conference, uh, talked about how in his culture, and because his family was able to do this, were able to have a space for his grandfather. After his grandmother died, his mm -hmm. grandfather stayed in a little separate place in their home during all his growing up years and the grandfather's health declined and needed help and all the rest of mm -hmm. that but he said the richness of his own life that increased because he had that interaction with his grandfather yes. simply cannot be measured yes absolutely who he who he has come to be yeah mm -hmm. yeah that's right it definitely has an impact so yeah well, ladies, we don't have any questions, but I've got just a couple more slides here. Okay, so with the SRNA's um, mandate changing to a uh, just a single uh, mandate of uh, regulation, um, with our webinars and some of our documents and stuff, we are starting to incorporate our standards, our practice standards and our entry level competencies so that people can perhaps make that linkage between what's been presented and how it fits into the standards and therefore see how it fits into their practice. Also, um, can also be used, <clears throat> you may want to use a session or something like that uh, for your continuing competence. So just putting that out there. So our RM practice standards, um, standard one, professional responsibility and accountability. And as every, every uh, presentation we have, being accountable and accepting responsibility for your own actions and decisions. Um, ethical practice, communicating respectfully and effectively in collaboration with client, family, colleagues, and others, and resolving conflict should it occur. And I think that's the big thing. Communication is key in every interaction that we have. And um, you were talking about some of the things, you know, talking loud or talking slower, that sort of thing. That's disrespectful too. just, you know, have a conversation um, as you normally would with anybody else. Service to the public, listening respectfully to the expressed needs of clients, families, and others. And uh, communicator, again, a lot of it's about communication, used evidence to form communication skills to build trusting, compassionate and therapeutic relationships with clients, and advocate, um, advocate for health quality, sorry, equity for all, uh, particularly for vulnerable and or diverse clients and populations, support and empower clients in making informed decisions about their health care and respect their decisions, and then advocate for the client's rights and ensure form, informed consent guided by legislation, practice standards and ethics. All right, so um, this is just some questions to take away, uh, things to think about um, after seeing this webinar. What's your biggest takeaway from the webinar? Um, I think my biggest thing, my biggest takeaway is um, ageism occurs, um, how do I put this? Um, ageism is something 
that I think after hearing today's presentation, it's not just younger people that are guilty of ageism. I shouldn't say guilty, that's the wrong word. That are, that um, fall into those ageism sort of uh, behaviors, but also the seniors as well. And I think the other big takeaway is it's, it's about respect and treating people um, respectfully. Um, what connection do you see between the standards, entry-level competencies, and, and the code of ethics and the information that was presented today? And I did give you uh, some of the uh, standards. And are you able to apply the information presented to your current practice? Um, so it may not be visible to you right now, but as you reflect on it, you might find that some of this information could be very helpful. Again, ladies, great presentation. I'm happy that we finally got this coordinated and got it there and we're gonna do yes. some more work together. And um, yes, again, thank you so much. So thank our you. webinar for next week um, on June the 23rd will be an overview of buprenorphine naloxone for opioid use disorder. If you've missed a webinar, you can view it on our YouTube channel. And again, thank you ladies and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye, ladies. Bye.